Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson and I'm the director of Stevenson Dental Solutions in San Dimas, California. We are a teaching center dedicated to excellence in general dentistry. I'm also an emeritus professor of clinical dentistry at UCLA and have a private practice in West Los Angeles and in San Dimas. Today we're going to be covering the composite preparation on tooth number nine on the confidant tooth as developed by Academal. Now, currently, they have two of these teeth that are available. Uh, one is a molar and one is the incisor. And today, we're going to be working on tooth number nine. In a subsequent video, I'm going to go ahead and make another video on tooth number 30, distal caries. So you can see the teeth are the same shape, essentially. But there is uh, multiple layers in this caries tooth, and it has mesial caries. It has a pulp, it has dentin, it has enamel. And the enamel is pretty hard. You can see when it's mounted in the Typeron, it is just slightly longer than the adjacent tooth. I checked a couple times to make sure I hadn't mounted it wrong, and it, it indeed is slightly longer as viewed from that facial view, but it looks actually really close to being a carbon copy of the original tooth. Now once we place the rubber dam for the ADEX, we're going to go ahead and uh, outline the preparation. I like to use some kind of a mechanical pencil to do this and we're just looking really close at the area. It's got a really small contact point so we want to be mindful of that. So if you were to... uh, I went ahead after I marked it and I removed the tooth just to show you the proximal preparation design. It's going to come in at a 90 degree angle and it's going to curve on the facial to follow the general curve of the facial wall. You can see the shape here as it wraps around the Marginal Ridge. You are in fact allowed to use pens, pencils, whatever in the uh, examination and actually in patients too uh, when, when you have good isolation it can be helpful. So keep an eye on this outline and, and, and understand that this is the ideal outline. Now I like to use a diamond burr. And why a 330 diamond? Well because this enamel is really hard and when we pop the burr out of the packet, make sure you grab it by the head here and then push out the back of the shank this way so you don't end up bending these uh, small burrs. And it's really easy to bend that tip if you push it out the other direction. As always on a class three, let's make sure that we are angling the burr 90 degrees or perpendicular to the lingual surface when we start the preparation. Of course, all of this will be in the mirror or you may be able to use a little bit of direct vision. Now, the enamel is really very hard and I would encourage you to go slowly and get a little bit of a, of a hole started so that the burr is a little bit more secure, more cradled by the periphery of enamel and then work it in towards the facial, trying to keep the burr perpendicular the entire time. I like to push the burr in to its entire length on these teeth, and I think it's going to give you about the right amount of facial extension for the ideal preparation. And you notice that I'm not using the burr at full speed, so, you know, take it easy here. We're trying to get about a millimeter 0.2 to 0.4 deep axially. In other words, as you push the burr towards the distal, that would be called axial depth. And facial extension, not facial depth, is the other dimension that we're looking at. And then perhaps we can also think about approximately 2 to 2.5 millimeters incisal gingivally with the gingival portion breaking contact and the incisal portion not breaking contact. And this is the, the general rule for the ideal class three preparation. And you've noticed that I've taken care to leave a little shell on the interproximal area. And this serves as a great protective mechanism. But what happens when you have to break off that shell? So this is where I would pull out maybe a fender wedge. This is a green one. They're in various different sizes, uh, four different sizes that you can utilize. And I think these are great to get a little bit of protection. A 10 6 14 enamel hatchet, brand new or very well sharpened, is going to be a great tool for you. Uh, 
if it's dull, it's going to be a real problem. Sturdivant chip is just that little chip where you, you knock off that little shell and then we can remove unsupported enamel by utilizing the hatchet so that we are creating the exit angle or the cable surface angle of at least 90 degrees. It really should be a little bit more obtuse than that, probably closer to 100 degrees to ensure that we don't have any undermined enamel. Even though this is a composite, we really want to try to minimize undermined enamel or unsupported enamel particularly on the incisal and gingival walls. Once we get to the facial wall, if the preparation becomes extended, that's the one area where undermine enamel would be allowed. Here we have just a little bit of remaining tooth structure. And I, I must caution you that if your hand instrument is not beautifully sharp, this can be a disastrous thing to do. So if you're a little nervous about using hand instrument, I would just suggest you switch over to uh, 330 RGS burr, which would be fantastic for, for doing this, or even just stay with that 330 diamond if you like. There are also some other diamonds that are really helpful. Uh, the 555D, which is like a 55 burr, and uh, that can be really helpful as well. And notice that we're always trying to think about the angle of departure, the exit angle, the cable surface margin angle, and whatever you want to call it, uh, while we're utilizing the hand instruments. We want the hand instruments to move us closer to the ideal preparation, not further away. We'll go ahead and remove the wedge now, now that we've got that little shell removed and we have the preparation uh, you know, nearly completed at this time. And you notice we have done zero at this point to remove decay other than whatever decay was in the path of the initial outline form. And I think this is an outline form that you could be really happy with. Uh, you can use the hatchet at this point to remove any roughness on that facial wall, but do not sharpen the line angles internally. Leave them rounded. This is the way composite likes to uh, be made so that the composite can flow well into those areas. When we look at this from the facial and turn it a little bit to the side, you can see that you can definitely see light through that area. And th this is important. You really have got to get your extensions facially to the point where they are visible from the side. So now, though, let's look for caries. Uh, we've got the ideal prep done, and uh, let's take a look at it. And I was uh, really surprised to see this very distinct orange-colored decay at the DEJ, uh, kind of about halfway up the facial wall incisally and then wrapping onto the incisal wall. Now, you know, it's important at this point to use an explorer to feel how hard things are. However, at the DEJ, even if it's hard, if it's stained, it's got to go. So there, you must make this distinction that when you have discoloration, at the DEJ, it must be removed, which means that you must extend your outline form. You notice at the end there, and this is the two round burr, but you notice at the end there, I was uh, putting the Explorer into the axial wall where it was quite, quite uh, soft. And so it's a good idea to get the examiner to give you permission for extension. I'd ask for probably a half a millimeter extension into the axial wall, and I don't think I would ask for much extension into the facial wall yet because I'm just trying to get an idea of will that stain go away easily with the end of this round burr? And that's really what I'm working on at this point. This is a two round burr. You could also use a four round burr. It's a little larger, so it's going to be a little safer to use in the sense that it won't penetrate axially quite as much. And then make sure you use the Explorer to check and verify that there is no decay left that's soft on the axial wall. So you need to pay attention to two different types of caries removal, tactile and visual. And typically I find that the visual is going to provide you with a lot of direction in the area of the outline. And that tactile is going to give you a lot of verification on the internal walls. However, 
that's not always the case. Sometimes something looks really stained internally and it's hard, and sometimes something looks perfect on the DEJ and it's very soft. So be aware of uh, all of those variables. And I was a bit surprised when I found that the decay at the DEJ, which was not soft, it was just discolored, extended dramatically incisally and facially. I had to keep progressing with the outline form. We would never want to leave a stained dentin next to the DEJ. It's, it's not wise because uh, it, it's subject to recurrent caries, uh, decreased bond strengths, etc. So even this prep looks really kind of typical, nice preparation, I'm finding that this prep needs to be extended quite a bit more facially and incisally. So don't despair, just uh, continue in the process. And I think it's really important to get the clinical floor examiner involved in this process with you. Let them know what you're finding. You, you find discoloration of the DEJ, you're not comfortable leaving it, and you believe that it must be removed. So this is a really important thing to get this buy-in from the floor examiner, but there it is. I mean, that is dramatic. And that is absolutely needing removal. And it is hard as can be. So we must keep going. So let's go back to the 330 diamond. Perhaps you could use a 330 RGS. And let's extend. I know we need to go more incisally because the incisal DJ is, is quite involved. So the entire prep is going to have to get bigger as a result. We just can't simply keep removing the DEJ and not create some resistance form and proper form to all the walls. So this preparation is going to become a longer rectangular shape and size of gingerly and is going to necessarily become more extended facially as well. And I was really taken aback by this because I thought that this was going to initially be an easy preparation but as you can see there I got to keep going and I have no choice. I must continue until the DEJ is squeaky clean. The DEJ needs to look like it came out of a non-carious tooth that just was extracted from a patient that needed maybe extractions. So uh, we have to just move the burr more facially and continue in this process. And we have to go further. And you can see it took a lot to get this stain removed. Now, there may be some stain on the axial wall, but this stain is not near the DJ and it is hard as a rock. So that was completely acceptable to keep. But this is nearly a class four. Look at the amount of extension that we needed to do to get all of the decay removed from the facial as well. So when I see a prep that's this large, I'm very concerned about retention. So we're gonna go ahead and place some large bevels here to get good retention. 7102 carbide works well because it's got a very narrow tip to it and I like it on exam situations to create this 0.5 to 1 millimeter bevel because I can get that tip almost into every location. You want to bevel all accessible margins. So if it's in the contact area, don't worry about it. You, you just are not going to have that area beveled. But in this case, because it's pretty large, I think I can get almost everything beveled except for that incisal wall. And just take your time, be careful. If you're looking to be uh, super cautious, this might be a time to reinsert a fender wedge or maybe an interguard, uh, a matrix band, something to protect the adjacent tooth because you've gotten this far, you've done a great job. The last thing you want to do now is hit the adjacent tooth. And we've all been there. It's um, 
it's really a you know a heart pounding uh, letdown when that does happen. But let's keep going uh, with this bubble. Probably uh, 45 degrees would be fine, but uh, I like the the way to describe this. My favorite way of hearing this is that a bevel is a change in direction, a change in direction of the wall. So it doesn't necessarily have to be 45 degrees. It doesn't have to be 60 or something like that. Just make sure that it's an obvious change in direction. And make it look so that the examiners, the graders, know what you are doing. Uh, don't make it haphazard. And I would not do a starburst bevel on this case. There's no reason to do any of these uh, procedures we would do in aesthetic dentistry for blending in aesthetics or whatever but you can see the dramatically large size here a little bit more like reality isn't it and you have no way of knowing what you're going to get because these competent teeth are variable Academal is supplying the teeth to the exam they're not the same as the teeth we're doing here they're slightly different so perhaps there'll be less decay but then again, maybe there'll be the same amount of decay, decay or even more decay. So uh, the critical part about using competent teeth on an examination is you just don't know what you're going to find until you get into the tooth. Start with the ideal preparation and then move from there. And keep in mind that if you need some help with this, just keep coming back to the videos. If you need some hands-on help, we have courses every year in preparation for the rev exam for the adex exam for any of the examinations and we're here to help so i want to thank you for uh, hanging in there with me on this long video i think it was important to watch it to the very end to see how it went and as always it's been a pleasure you take care